this sucks what I'm about to say to y'all because but it is pretty much the best way of saying it is that especially with books especially with literature the answer is whatever you guys decide is the best answer you've got to make the arguments for the best case I know this really sucks you guys especially because every other subject there is an answer for <laughs> You know, but that is the nature of art. When we study art and literature, it's one of our great arts, is that what we're dealing with in literature is that we're dealing with the absolute uncertainty that there is multiple answers to any question. And you can't wrestle this little beast down. What you can do is come up with an answer, test it against other answers, and in the process of testing it, you get something better than an answer. You get insight. And I think that that's the thing that literature gives you, is literature is less involved in giving you answers and much more dedicated to giving you insight. Yeah? You might not know what that means, but talk about it in 15, what, what that she's trying to say, but talking about it for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes will just give you a lot more of what you really need to know. And I know that's a, a shitty answer, but it's really the one I believe in, you know? Boyfriend. I should have been careful with the weed. Most people, it just fucks up, but me, it makes me sleepwalk. And wouldn't you know, I woke up in the hallway of our building feeling like I'd been stepped on by my high school marching band. My ass would have been there all night if the folks in the apartment below hadn't been having themselves a big old fight at three in the morning. I was too fried to move, at least right away. And boyfriend was trying to snake girlfriend, saying he needed more space. And she was like, motherfucker, I will give you all the space you need. <laughs> I saw him at the bar. I knew boyfriend a little. I saw him at the bars and saw some of the girls he used to bring home while she was away, and I knew he just needed more space to cheat. Fine, he said, but every time he went for the door, she got to crying and would be like, why are you doing this to me? They sounded a lot like me and my old girlfriend Loretta, but I swore to myself that I would stop thinking about her ass, even though every Cleopatra-looking Latina in the city made me stop and wish she would come back to me. By the time boyfriend got himself in the apartment, got himself out of the apartment, got himself out in the hallway, I was already in my apartment. Girlfriend would not stop crying. Twice she tried, she must have heard me moving around right above her, and both times I held my breath until she started up again. I followed her into the bathroom, the two of us separated by a floor, wires, and some pipes, and she kept saying, ese fucking pepeton, and washed her face over and over again. It would have broken my heart if it hadn't been so damn familiar but I guess I'd gotten numb to that sort of thing. I had heart leather like walruses got blubber. The next day I told my boy Harold about what happened and he said, too bad for her. And I said, I guess so. And he said, if I didn't have my own woman problems, I'd say we should go comfort the widow. And I said, she ain't our type. And he said, the hell she ain't. Homegirl was too beautiful, too high class for a couple of knuckleheads like us. Never saw her in a t-shirt or without jewelry. And her boyfriend, olvídate. That nigga could have been a model. Hell, they both could have been models, which was what they probably were, considering that I never heard word one pass between them about a job or a fucking boss. People like these were untouchables to me raised on some other planet and then transplanted into my general vicinity to remind me how bad I was living. What was worse was how much Spanish they shared. None of my girlfriends ever spoke Spanish, not even Loretta of the Puerto Rican attitudes. The closest thing for me was this black chick who'd spent three years in Italy. She liked to talk that shit in bed and said she'd gone with me because I reminded her of some of the Sicilian men she'd known. 
which was why I never called her again. <laughs> Boyfriend came around a couple of times that week for his things, and I guess to finish the job. He was a confident prick. He listened to what she had to say, arguments that had taken her hours to put together, and then he would sigh and say it didn't matter. He needed his space, punto. She let him fuck her every time, maybe hoping that it would make him stay. But you know, once somebody gets a little escape velocity going, ain't no play in the world gonna stop them from leaving. I would listen to them going at it and I would be like, damn, <clears throat> ain't nothing more shabby than those farewell fucks. I would know me and Loretta had a lot of those to go around. The difference was we never talked the way these two would about our days, not even we were cool together. These two had a thing about the bathroom. Each one of his visits ended up there, which was fine by me, it was where I could hear them the best. <laughs> I don't know why I started following her life, but it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. Mostly I thought people, even at their worst, were pretty fucking boring. I guess I, was busy. I wasn't busy with anything else, especially not with women the bathroom girlfriend talked a mile a minute about her day how she saw a fist fight on the sea how somebody liked her necklace and boyfriend with his smooth barry white voice just kept saying yeah <laughs> yeah they'd shower together and if she wasn't talking it sounded like she was going down on him all you would hear down there was the water smacking the bottom of the tub and him going yeah <laughs> yeah he wasn't sticking around though, that was obvious. He was one of those dark skinned, smooth faced brothers that women kill for, and I knew for a fact, having seen his ass in action at the local spots, that he liked to get over on the white girls. She didn't know nothing about his Rico Suave routine. It would erect her. I used to think those were the barrio rules, Latinos and blacks in, whites out. But love teaches you clears your head of any rules. Loretta's new boyfriend was Italian and walked, worked on Wall Street. When she told me about him, we were still going out. We were walking on the promenade and she said to me, I like him, he's a good worker. No amount of heart leather could stop something like that from hurting. And we'll stop here, thank you. Uh, there was a recent wonderful uh, profile of Toni Morrison uh, that you were quoted in. And you talked about what it meant to see her on the cover of Time magazine, uh, and this would have been years ago now, and that it gave you hope. Yeah. That it gave you hope, it gave you, it made you dream of a literary landscape where maybe you didn't feel so alienated. Um, and you talked about how you basically haven't seen that come to fruition. So I wanted to ask one, if you could talk, uh, especially the students here, what that hope looked like and to uh, talk to what the landscape looks like now and how to prepare oneself. Yeah, I mean, this was a long time ago. Um, you know, guys, that there was a period of time, for those of you old enough to remember this, there was a period of time when it looked like the contributions of black women, women of color, what would they call third world feminists, was going to be the forefront of what we would call U.S. literature. In fact, uh, all of these writers, you know, but predominantly women of color, predominantly um, folks coming out of these kind of women of color feminist tradition were just completely revolutionizing literature. The kind of works that they were doing, the kind of questions that they were raising, the kind of books that they were producing, yeah, um, it was extraordinarily fecund and an extraordinarily promising time for literature. And for those of us who were there at that time, you know, I mean, I could still remember the debates that were happening with Toni Morrison and Ishmael Reed and Alice Walker and Stanley Couch, the Crouch. These were debates that were taking part in, that were t happening in the community. And I think that the incredible innovations and the incredible sort of um, I would argue that just the, the literary merit of so many of these projects 
I think was swiftly shunted to the side. When you were coming out of this tradition, we were Rutgers, and these were the books that everybody was talking about. And then I think what ended up happening was that, you know, the powers that be being the powers that be. It's sort of like for those of you who are old enough to remember hip-hop from the beginning. You know, hip-hop does not sound the way hip-hop used to sound. I'm not just talking about a technical achievement. Even the sort of the materials that the popular songs cover now are very different. And I just think that um, we were looking at a landscape where it wasn't going to be, you know, 99% white. We were looking at a landscape where it was like going to look like America. And that the folks who we were so unused to hearing from um, at a national level were going to be the folks who were in many ways at the center of the conversation. And that did not turn out to be the case. It did not turn out to be the case. It's an extraordinary, it's extraordinary how quickly, how quickly women of color writers, especially black women writers, um, were moved out of the conversation. When you think about that generation of black women writers, you know, when you think about Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and the whole gang, try to name the African-American women writers today who are writing today, who are young, who have that kind of profile. It's extraordinary, the gap. You know, it's really, really extraordinary. Now, there is an enormous amount of really important, really valuable young black women writers. I mean, an extraordinary amount. But I just think that they're not being given the center of the conversation in ways that we imagined that would be. And so uh, it was a big shift for us. When I was a young writer and I was a young reader, that time felt so promising. You know, and I've realized, you know, looks like we're just going to have to take another round at it to win. Sometimes, you know, you think you're going to win in third round. Well, looks like we're going to need another round. You know, because really literature in the U.S. is so white, it just like hurts your fucking teeth. I do want to say uh, that with the, the upcoming round, are there, are there writers that you're paying attention to right now? Roxanne Gay comes to mind. Paul Beatty just had a great book, The Sellout. It was fantastic. It was, I've never read anything like it. The no, satire I mean, of that level. Yeah, it's like I said, there's, there's an incredible range of young writers out there and writers who are working, who have been working for quite a while. You know, and who have produced a really important body of work. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Paul Beatty's. Um, I've been following Paul since he was first published uh, with White Boy Shuffle, a seminal novel. I'm a huge fan of folks as, you know, why, uh, my girl, um, uh, Edwige Dantecat. You know, I mean, the, it's, the question isn't that we don't have the writers. The question is how much access do our communities have to the mechanisms of power? Yeah, in other words, like, how, who's deciding who gets rewarded? Who's deciding who gets evaluated? I mean, when they ran the numbers, for example, in the New York Times book review, and how many Latinos, guys, there's a ton of Latino writers. And I'm not talking about Latin American. I'm talking about U.S. Latino writers. There is a ton of U.S. Latino writers producing books every damn year. And the one year they ran the numbers, the New York Times, out of the what? The, it was some incredible number. The hundreds of hundreds of reviews that they did, they reviewed one U.S. Latino author. And so the question isn't that, not, that we're not producing the work. is that we're not being given the space and the attention that our community deserves. And this is an old problem. We've been fighting it a long time. Fortunately, young people and older folks are gotten hip to this shit. And, you know, I think they're starting to make the kinds of moves that are very, very heartening. Do you think the Internet's helping with that conversation with breaking down some of those powers of structure? It ain't hurting. <laughs> no, it ain't hurting. I mean, look, it's, it's always a weird question about new technological advancements because the same way that, you know, the same way digital media helps us spread stuff, the folks that have the power utilize digital media to also push their fucking shit, you know? And so I think that one has to always be mindful that the thing that we think will bring revolution also brings oppression. And I think these things are tools, and they're not all good, and they're not all bad, and it depends on who's deploying them how, you know? 
I just think, again, I, I would argue deeply that we, we're still in this place where the kind of attention that we deserve as artists is not being given. And just the fact that I have won a literary lottery or some other writer of color has won the literary lottery, it's not that we're ungrateful. That's not what's at issue. It's that just because we elect Barack Obama doesn't mean the black community's I. <laughs> like, that's not the way it works, as you can tell. You know, and so that's, I think, it's very important. It's, it's not individuals. We have to look at the health of our communities, our literary communities. And I would argue our literary communities of color um, are being underserved by the literary establishment at every level. And we will change that, I promise. I want to make mention of another survey that Publishers Weekly did recently, um, in which, obviously, a huge, huge swaths of diverse authors, um, but just like in the industry that it's basically, uh, I think, somewhere in like the 98 percentile white behind the scenes. Oh yeah, no, there's like very few editors of color. You know, it's it's a wild thing. But look, those of us who are immigrants or the child of immigrants, we, we understand how this context also impacts us and how it works, you know? I mean, there's so many of us who are in our families the first to go to college. There's so many of us who want to be a thing and don't even know other people in our communities who've been that thing. Yeah, There's so much territory for us that has been exclusively, in many ways, saved for other communities. And I think that all of us, whether we're in literature or we're involved in other areas, know that there is much territory that belongs to us, but that has been unfairly apportioned to privileged communities. And it's affected us and our choices, and it's important for us to make the kinds of choices that will permit us access to these things. You know, And as an immigrant, believe me, if I went as an immigrant only to the places I was told to go, I would have been fucked. Every time someone gives you a formula of what you should be and what you should do, you should know that that is basically a pair of handcuffs. You know, and it's, it's a very valuable lesson I picked up when I was in college. I wish I picked it up earlier. I just want to use this one moment with this room full of students to, to play off of that for a second and just encourage, like, you can try, like, you can start a website if you have the tools here at the school, um, and you can become an editor, and you can publish your friend's work. Um, and I just really want to encourage that because I feel like uh, as much as we need diverse books and we need diverse writers, we need diverse editors, we need people that are going to work in this industry um, and change this industry from any way. Um, and th that's just something I just like always want to encourage. Moving from the real world to the fantastical world, and then I want to open it up for questions because you guys are all much smarter than I am. Uh, I want to talk about world building. Mm. Um, that famous syllabus of yours in the class that you teach at MIT got some great books on it, but I'm wondering if there's any book right now or anything that's not on there that you absolutely love to look towards when it comes to like being a, a writer and trying to build out a fantastic world. Well, you know, I mean, the idea of world building is, it's a simple idea. I don't know if anybody here reads biographies at all. It's kind of a specialized subject, you know, you're like biographies. You know, guys, if you're going to write a biography about somebody who lives in whatever time, Let's say they're living up in the 20s, or they're going to live in the what we would call the high Victorian, or they're living in the 1740s. It's not solely, you're not solely describing that person. What you've got to describe is that person's world. Yeah, people don't make sense unless we understand their world. I mean, that's why don't you know your friends better when you actually fucking hang out at their houses? You know, it's real easy to be full of that come mierderia when nobody knows who the fuck your family is, but when they suddenly meet your family, oh, but ahora yo veo, coño, de donde viene esto? You know, and that's part of the way humans put together signification. They put together signification because they take the whole world into account. Yeah? And so part of, for example, biography, the biography does, good biography does well, is it first sells you the world because by understanding the world, you understand what it means to make the decisions that the, the person who's under the lens, the person whom the book is about, is making. So for some people, going to college is completely expected. 
It is like not even thought about. Others of us live in world where going to college is a really big fucking deal where we have no one who could help us fill out our financial aid forms, no one who could give us advice about what classes we can pick, nobody who can mentor us in the distinctions between certain kinds of majors. Yeah? And we don't have context. We don't have mentors. For us to go to college and then to compete with other students who have all of these things, this is an entirely different world. And so to build worlds both as a literary person but even as a biographer is an essential part of how do we explain people. Because some people are a product of their world and some people are in conflict with their world and that matters to us. You know? So whenever I think about world building, I always think that like historical fiction is super awesome at making that shit happen. Makes it very, very clear. You know? I teach Game of Thrones, you know? I love Game of Thrones, but there's a book, for example, that I would teach if my students actually liked to read really huge books, but they don't. You know, there's this book from like the 80s called Clan of the Cave Bear. Yes. Clan of the Cave Bear, it's kind of like Crow Magnum. It's, it's like quote unquote caveman historical fiction. But in a book, you've got to first sell the world. And how do you convince somebody to sit through a 600 page novel about? Neanderthals and Cro-Magnums. And it's a kind of a remarkable book for world building. You know, people can diss the book for anything they want, but it's, it's kind of hot, I have to tell you. My students, of course, take a look at the length and they're like, yo, professor, no. <laughs> like, it's not that one is not receptive to the question. It's, it's a strange question that, I mean, I never hear white writers being asked, do you feel f weird about representing white people? Does your representation of white people, is it, don't you think that that's deeply troubling? <laughs> and what's really interesting is that how, as people of color, we're under this really unfair burden that we're supposed to be somehow the hyper-representational. And we, even amongst ourselves, duplicate that. We're so unused to seeing ourselves in books that we assume a book that's written about an incredibly specific Dominican family. I'm sorry, like this family goes out of its way to distinguish themselves. <laughs> the family is elite. From its history, it is an elite family who suffers tremendously under the dictatorship. It is a middle-class Dominican family. 90% of Dominicans I know didn't put their kids in fucking private school. And 90% of the Dominicans I know don't own fucking houses. You know, so this is a family that is a middle class Dominican family who all its kids go to college. Last time I know, most of the Dominican kids, I didn't grow, I didn't grow up with that. I was like the first person in my hood who was like, oh, I think I'm gonna go to college. They're like, all right, dork, you know? <laughs> and so when I'm thinking about how is this family how are we reading this family as some sort of stand-in for every Dominican family? Can it be? That would not be up to me. Who a reader decides to identify with and who a reader decides to feel solidarity with is not something that the writer has a hand in. You guys love fucking books about vampires and shit. <laughs> There ain't no such fucking thing as a vampire. <laughs> and yet you're able to connect really powerfully. Some of you be fucking freaking out on Game of Thrones. That shit doesn't exist. <laughs> but you've got no problems feeling like, yeah, Stanith is my man. <laughs> you know? And so for me, the question would be, what about, what about these very specific characters in the book would lead someone to think that I'm making an argument that these people are a stand-in for all Dominicans. Now, what's really important to know is that if you belong to a community of color, communities of color like to self-exotify. Community of color like to say, well, all we black folks do this. We all like to say, oh, that's some Dominican shit. <laughs> Even if we haven't met more than 1% of Dominicans. And simply representing that habit inside of a community doesn't mean you endorse it. 
right? So if my Dominican characters are saying something about Dominicans, guys, that's just representation. You have to bring yourself into the book in a deeper way and ask, what, ask what is the book arguing? When I think about who my audience is, yeah, I think that that's, for me, kind of a straightforward question, yeah? I always, in my head, when I'm writing my book, I always think, I want my six best friends to feel this book. Yeah? Are they predominantly Dominican? Yep. When I think of my audience, I'm like, I want the Dominican diaspora in all its diversity. I want folks from that diaspora to find something in the book to be in conversation with. All Dominicans? No, that's impossible. I'm writing a book. It's not a religion. A religion can be for all souls, but a book isn't. A book isn't meant for everybody. I mean, that's why we have so many books. You don't like my book? That's dope. Find one you do like. And that's normal. You know? So I think of it in those terms, you know? I think of it in those terms. I mean, I just, I think that what is really, really important for us is that even if people are different from us, we can feel connected to them. I want people to feel connected to my characters even across the span of time and space. And I know a lot of Dominicans who are not middle class, who didn't send their kids to private school and connect to these, this literature very strongly. And the question is, is that about Dominicanness, Or is that about the fact that the characters are speaking to them on a deeper level? It's hard to know. It's hard to know. Yeah. But I don't lose any sleep about representing the Dominican community because I don't have characters who are called the Dominican man. <laughs> the Dominican man says, or the Dominican woman. I'm really trying to do art about a specific group. And what's really great is by the more specific you get, the more likely you are to get universal. You will have universal effects in your work by carving a very specific, narrow humanity. The broader you are, the less likely you are to be universal. You know? So, I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. I mean, is that some kind of answer? Do you have a follow-up question? I feel you're... <laughs> yeah, don't worry. My mother's like, you always look dumb to me. So, that's an improvement. I guess... Most of the women here who have mothers can probably answer that question better than me. I mean, shit. I have two sisters, and I watched my sisters have to, for as much as my sisters loved my mother, they had to defeat my mother to have lives. And it's not every woman. Shit, there's a huge diversity. But I was really interested in the kind of mother-daughter relationships where half the time the love is so strong that the mother would probably suffocate the daughter with it. You know? And I, I just was really, really interested in that. I just think some, especially women of color, especially women of African descent, Caribbean women of African descent, there's this, there's some, there's just this dynamic which I've seen repeat that really, really interested me and I wanted to approach it through this very specific family. And I just know, I just... So many of the women in my life have had to have dealt with their mother and their mother's way of loving them is not something that they ever reproduce with their own children. You know, guys, I'm 46. Most of the people in my life have kids. Most of the women I know have kids and they are not raising their kids the way their mother raised them. With all respect to their mom, with all respect, it's like my sister once said something to me in high school that really got me thinking. And I think I... I just thought it would be great to explore. My sister was like, you know, my, our mother is on your case, but our mother thinks she owns my body. My mother, our mother acts like she gets a vote on what my pussy does. <laughs> and I thought that was real deep, man. As a brother, I was like, oh, shit. 
And I, I've, I've run this by a bunch of my girls, like my girlfriends, the women I've dated all these years. And so many of the Dominican women I dated, and they're very, very different women from very different backgrounds. They're like, yeah, I fucking recognize that shit. <laughs> so I'm not trying to say it was all women. It was just one narrow group, and it just really interested me. You know, because as a dude, my mother, again, I, I always say this, but it's true. My mom, I don't know, man. My mom let me do almost anything I wanted, Joe. You know, and my sister, my sister, like the phone would fucking ring and it would be a dude. My mom would be like, <laughs> and just hang that shit up. Oh, my sister was like, they, if my mom could put my sister in a box, she would have. And my brother was, I had an older brother who was wiling. Like my brother was wiling. Like he literally was wiling the fuck out. And he's in high school. And my mom was like, ay, pero coño tan lindo. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's a tough question, man. But I do think, hey, man, the more daughters that can testify to their relationships to mother, whether it's in film, whether it's an essay, I think it's important, man. I think, like, the male obsession with father-son stories. Watch how many fucking movies are out there, and they're about dads and their sons. You know? I just shit. That shit could stop for 50 years, and we still have too much. Gang, I mean, again, I, I, again, we have so much variety. You never know who anyone is or what they're going through. But I, you know, in general, my general sense of the world is that there, are, there's a reason that there's systems, right? This system called patriarchy. There's a reason that shit has been able to fucking survive and in many ways grow, despite the fact that patriarchy all it does is create victims. Yeah, and yet it has a great powerful hold on our imaginaries and our ideologies. And I just think, again, I can only speak to my context, Dominican Republic, then central New Jersey, a poor community in central New Jersey, and the way I grew up, right? Working poor. And working poor, as you know, that just means that we didn't come from Santo Domingo, so the motherfuckers didn't work. Every single one of my generation, the kids, we had jobs from 13 and never stopped. I look at my cousins now up in the Bronx, and they're like lamping. They're like, I don't have a fucking job, you know. And it's a very different world, you know. And I just, I, and there's very specific reasons why this is true. But just the narrow group of people I grew up with, mo the boys I knew, their instruction manual to be a boy was guaranteed to fuck them all up. In other words, all of us, when we looked at our instruction manual, I had one of my boys was Egyptian. We grew up together. You know what I'm saying? One of my boys was Colombian. One of my boys was African-American. When we all looked at each other's instruction manuals, they were slightly different, but they all had the same effect. You are, follow these rules as a man, and you will be destroyed. And in the process, you will destroy everyone else around you, and we'll call it a tie. And I think it often takes a lot of work for the average man to undo their commitment and investment to these really maligned sets of codes and rules. I mean, fundamentally, the average boy that I grew up with, I'm not talking about all men, but the average boy I grew up with was told that masculinity is at odds with vulnerability. In other words, if you are vulnerable, you're not a man and that's it. Well, what does that guarantee? That guarantees that any guy who follows this code will never have a friend and will never have real intimacy. You can have, say, these are all my boys, these are all my boys, but without vulnerability, there can't be true friendship. And there certainly cannot be intimacy, you know? And I think that as a guy, I felt as a guy, I'm 46, you guys. I've spent all of these years trying to undo the basic operation system I was given. And I think we just got to keep doing it. And we've got to start earlier and try to get some guidance around this and sure literature helps because so little of narratives about men offer them any useful alternative 99 percent of the stories that have boys at the center which are 99 percent of the popular stories they're just there to teach boys to repeat the same old fucked up shit power invulnerability no vulnerability and the belief, the fundamental belief that women are not human. At its core, 
And the male operating system has, at its core, the belief that women are not human. That women are these strange partial beings that are there to serve limited functions, and one of them predominantly is sex. And if you can't see half the species as human, it means you're not seeing yourself as human. And it's guaranteed to just fuck you up. You know, it's, it's hard, right? Because one doesn't want to be judgmental about people's numinous systems, right? Like, I think that we always have to figure out ways to sustain and what, we, what is called reconstitute ourselves, right? This society takes you apart every second. And you've got to figure out ways to reconstitute yourself, yeah? And certainly people will practice Eastern religion, and that's part of belief and also some sort of spiritual regeneration. So I got nothing to say specifically about your relatives and what they're doing, right? <laughs> but what I will tell you is that there is a really old tradition of Orientalism in the West, whether it's the North or the South, of reducing incredibly complicated cultural and religious systems down to really simplistic, kind of, I hate to say it, simplistic gibberish. And I'm, not, I'm sure that's not what your folks are up to or your relatives are up to, but let's just say that there's a very old storied tradition of folks who are not Asian getting down with Asian shit because the belief is that Asian people are perpetually these mystical, you know, these kind of the perpetual mysterious mystical oriental. And of course, none of this is true. And so I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but it just shows you that it used to be Orientalism was the precinct of the developed West. But now even the South is in on it. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly that that's entirely positive. You know, the same way when people reduce Dominicans down to merengue, fucking bachata, baseball, and a platano. You know? <laughs> It's fucking weird shit, man. I mean, you have no idea how many times people come up to me and kick some wild, simplistic formulas, but they think that shit's positive. I mean, you have, I grew up with a lot of African Americans. I have a lot of brothers who come up to me. They're just like, yo, I fucking love Dominican women. Because, and I'm like, you love all Dominican women? <laughs> a strange fucking formula, yo. <laughs> no, it would be, that's like a very strange formula, you know, like, you just change that a little bit and Adolf Hitler could co-sign on that shit. No, it's like a real weird sweeping generalization that doesn't help us. Because in a way, it just reduces our individualism down to a group. And we suffer from that. The construction of Junior. Um, he's, my, he's my protagonist in everything I've written so far. And I guess I kind of picked him because first of all, he's a sort of alter ego for me. I kind of you know, guys, I mean, I don't know about anyone else. I, I felt like growing up in the kind of situation I grew up with, I, I was a poor immigrant. Plenty of us are poor immigrants, you know? In a, a family that in many ways it left this kind of fucked up dictatorship to come to the United States and encountered an enormous amount of fucked up shit in the United States. You know, you think you're living, you know, like out of the frying pan into the fire. That cliche sometimes is really appropriate for a lot of us immigrants, you know? The idea that the United States is a saving place uh, doesn't look as true when you're looking up close as a poor person, you know? And so I guess I, my family went through so much shit, like growing up the way we did, it like guaranteed you like you were gonna, I don't know, you're gonna be traumatized, man. Like, I don't know, I, my childhood was really traumatic growing up poor and with people like shooting each other and people like stabbing each other and your relatives and neighbors are getting locked up and not having enough money for food. Like, I don't know, man. Like, doing that year after year after year and, like, stepping out of your house and people calling you a nigger and a spick and all sorts of wild shit. And, you know, then you taking part in the system and then being fucked up to other people, you know, because you're not just a victim, right? Like, you just being, like, hateful and I don't know, man. It was... It was a lot, and I kind of was trying to figure out a character who would allow me to talk about what it meant to grow up as this young immigrant of African descent, a colored poor kid from a family that had been through a lot of trauma. And I kind of 
organized junior as a way to allow me to access that. And what I did was simply, I was like, I'm going to create a character who is smarter than me and who lies all the time to everybody in his life, but especially the women, but he never lies to the person reading. In other words, he always tells the truth, his truth, to whoever's reading the book. So Junior's thing is that he's really an incredibly honest narrator, except to everybody in his life. You know, Junior will be like, oh yeah, that guy's acting like a jigaboo. You know, he'll just say some wild shit, but he's trying to be honest, but then he won't be honest to himself or to other people. And, and that contradiction felt very, very valuable. You know, and I wanted Junior to be a guy who knew that the systems that he was engaged in were going to destroy him, but to not have the willpower or the wherewithal to overcome them. And I think there's a lot of us who know that the shit we're doing ain't any good, and yet we can't stop ourselves from doing it. How many, you know, again, I hate to quote, you know, people I know, but a friend of mine, she's like, how many of the women, this friend of mine saying, do I know, know that you're not supposed to hate your body as a woman, and yet know that by hating your body, by demonizing parts of your body, you're damaging your self-esteem, you're damaging yourself, but yet how many women find that really hard to let go of? And so I kind of wanted to write a character like that. He couldn't let go of the shit that was going to eat him alive, you know? And by making him really smart, it allowed me to sort of contrast because as communities of color, we're often viewed as people who are not intellectual, as people who are not readers, as people who are not nerdy, you know? And I think what, why Junior is so wild is that in many ways he was like so many of us who grew up in conditions where we were not expected to be intellectuals, we were not expected to be academics, we were not expected to be scholars. And yet Junior is among the smartest characters that I could possibly produce. And he is really strange because he is ghetto as fuck. I grew up super ghetto, he's ghetto. And yet this dude will fuck you up if you want to match brains with him. Look, we're in a weird situation. And I think most of you feel it as strongly as I feel it. We're in a situation, we're in the great age of inequality. And the great age of inequality, as you know, is that everything is beginning to resemble the Brazilian economy in the 80s. And for those of you who don't know what that looked like, is where three people have everything and 120 million people don't even got shoes. Yeah? And I think that that's in many ways what's happening, is that even in literature, there's this great inequality where everybody's reading the same 10 or 12 authors. You know? Everybody's reading the same couple of books. It's hard for you know, authors of different kind of backgrounds to get into these circuits. And when you do, you become the author everybody reads. And then it ends up silencing other people. Yeah, I think that what we need more than anything is what we need. Not only do we need to have more diversity, but we also have to start going against what everybody else is reading. I think we need to have people read more rebelliously and more adventurously. And luckily, we have teachers who are the ones who are leading that charge. I mean, if it wasn't for our fucking high school teachers, most of us writers wouldn't have careers. Because let me tell you, for the first 12 years I was a writer, when nobody knew anything about me as an author, no one knew. I would come to a reading like this, and there'd be three fucking people, and two of them would be related to me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's how come you know... You know, you believe in your art. And I would do this year after year after year. I would come into a reading. There'd be two fucking people there. You know, and you've got to like be like, yo. And if it wasn't for high school teachers, I wouldn't even had those three people there. You know, so when I'm here with you guys, I'm really happy and I'm gratified that you're here. But I never forget, I can't, that there should only be two of you. And I think that part of what we're talking about 
is that yes, we've got to challenge the power to be, challenge the status quo, get more writers, get more women of color, get more queer writers, change the way that we evaluate what counts as literature, what counts as great literature, but also I think that all of us got to start acting like we're high school teachers, the committed high school teachers who pass good books to each other. You know, in many ways, guys, it is up to us to create a diverse canon. And we've got to fucking search every. If you have not read a great Asian American novel this year, you've got to find a way to read a great Asian American novel. If you haven't read a great novel by a queer writer, you got to do it. You know, you got to find what's your formula and try to step outside of that. It is in that exploration. It is in that venturing off the path that the kinds of literary communities that we're all dreaming about, diverse, heterogeneous, that's where they're created. And certainly activism is going to help. And certainly our commitment to this kind of diversity. But more than anything is that we've all got to participate. We've got to go off the map. And I know it sounds fucking like bullshit, like let's hold hands in kumbaya, but for real, if we push ourselves a little bit to engage with art, we will help sustain the practice that has kept our civilizations alive and healthy for a very long time. We are not going to survive what we have to survive without art. And art is not going to survive unless we commit ourselves to it. Not simply because we're producers of it. We have to engage it at the level of it is part of our lives. Anyway, thank you guys so much. <laughs>